Mental illness TikTok is a cesspool. This should not be surprising. Most commentary YouTubers have made videos about it at some point in the last year, but also most of those commentary YouTubers don't know the wider disability context, which has led them to fall into some of the same traps that they then critique in other people's videos on their videos on the topic, which is just as much of a problem because it further spreads misinformation in a very different direction, some of which is just as dangerous and is seen as right because it's debunking the other thing. I link some of their videos in the description to credit where I got my ideas from because sources are important, but please do not go harass those creators. They tried their best. And I know that the nuanced conversation of this is gonna be absolutely disgusting messy and I have a lot of hot takes. So I've been avoiding making this video for some months, but I also know that based on like, Murphy's Law, if I wait any longer to make this video with the legislation that's in play right now, TikTok will get banned and then the topic will be outdated and all of my research piled up will have been pointless. So here we are. My theory is if I hurry on this video now, TikTok won't get banned. Um, also, no matter what you think about TikTok, whether it's good or bad, whatever, the way this legislation can and will be used after taking down TikTok to deal with other things should terrify you. So please call your senators. Anyway, if you're new here, hi, um, my name is Sydney. My pronouns are they, them. I'm an openly queer, disabled, autistic, trans, not binary actor, composer, educator, and disability advocate. I also have a, or almost very nearly have a degree in psychology and theater. Um, I'm currently working on a thesis about disability education, media theater performance, accessible education, basically anything else in any and all of those categories, culminating in the world's first all neurodivergent cast and crew production of The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. You can learn about all of that in the links in my description. You can also find tickets there because we open in just a few weeks. Ah, you should come see it. Also, I'm a white person in their early 20s with shoulder length, light brown curly hair. I am wearing a muscle tee that has frogs on it and I am sitting in front of a bookshelf. Also, if you're jealous of my shirt, which you should be, um, the boy section of Target, a great place to be. We were getting costumes for Curious at Target the other day, and we walked into the boys section to try to find a space shirt for Christopher, and I was like, frog shirt, and now it's mine, and it's my favorite. Anyway, I don't even know how to begin with this. I think the first thing to say is that in all of my research, absolutely everything that goes like, mental illness, TikTok, bad, refers to ADHD as a mental illness. And we're gonna get into the fundamental flaws of categorization, miscategorization, and diagnostic concepts shortly, but if we ignore the entire nuanced conversation of stigma is bad, and diagnostic words and distinctions are sketchy in general, when people hear the term mental illness, just like regular people, they think of things that can be managed or cured or medicated for, which is also not totally accurate to mental illness, but that's a discussion for another day. This is our just colloquial understanding of the word. And that is an inherently problematic view with which to look at ADHD. Because neurodevelopmental disorders like ADHD, autism, dyslexia, cerebral palsy, and intellectual disability are inherently not mental illnesses and they function super differently. They are neurodevelopmental disorders. And we need to not conflate the two because when people start looking at neurological conditions as something that can be cured, that gets really dangerous and really eugenics-y really, really, really quickly. As a disability creator seeing anybody, regardless of whether I agree with what they have to say about the topic of mental illness, TikTok or not, if they refer to ADHD as a mental illness, that is an automatic red flag that they are not particularly qualified to be talking about this. But we're gonna get into qualifications in a bit. The most common issue that we hear spoken about most is how TikTok is making mental illnesses trendy, kind of in the same way that Tumblr did, but on a much larger scale. And there are a few different ways that this tends to happen. The first is the whole, these super generic symptoms of being a human being are traits of this disorder situation. I'm thinking of the videos that are like, lesser known traits of ADHD, bouncing your leg, being impatient, fatigue, tiredness, disorganization, frequent earworms, and procrastination. And first of all, everybody experiences all of those things. Those are generic as heck. It is logical that creators would do this because the more people relate to these things, the more engagement they're going to get and therefore the better their content is going to do. Even informative content on TikTok is on some level formatted to be highly shareable rather than to say nuanced and informative. Also typically these unknown traits of X disorder things are usually the first things that come up when you Google symptoms of X disorder, or there are a bunch of things that everybody experiences that could potentially be linked to that disorder, but they also could be linked to any other disorder or just like a generic trait of being a human being. Another thing that I often find, particularly with ADHD TikTok, is that people will go on and on and on, but all these experiences that they have because of their ADHD that are autistic traits which by extension further stigmatizes autism as, oh, that thing over there that I'm not, I'm just ADHD. And I'm thinking of one particular creator here who keeps appearing on my recommendations and is dragging me up the wall, but I'm not naming names in this video because a lot of other creators that I've seen talk about this will just like show other people's TikToks and that also feels unfair to like 
I don't know, show other people as examples of what not to do. I don't know. I didn't like that. And you may not get why the ADHD autism dichotomy matters so much and why this discussion matters so much, but let's bring in some historical context, yeah? So people couldn't be diagnosed with both autism and ADHD until the DSM update in 2013. And because accommodations are very similar between the two, and there is significant overlap in the two diagnoses and people in those diagnostic groups, large groups of people were diagnosed with ADHD because it had less stigma and are now figuring out that they were actually autistic the whole time or autistic and ADHD the whole time. This therefore further stigmatized autism and made people start to delegitimize ADHD because it was oversaturated in the population. There's a long history of some of the more palatable autistic traits being seen as ADHD traits and other autistic traits being put down as inherently negative, further alienating autistic people and making people deny autistic people the proper diagnoses that they need and the proper care. ADHD TikTok also often takes other characteristically neurodivergent things that span lots of neurodiverse categories and say, oh, they're all ADHD traits. An example of this is speech patterns, which we've discussed before. We primarily discussed autistic speech patterns, but they can and do expand out to other neurodivergencies, or they will talk about the positive superpower aspects of disorders to make people want to be a part of that group, to wish they had this disorder so that they can claim this trait and say, well, yeah, it's because of this that I'm like this. I've also seen literally every mental illness or disorder discussed on TikTok as including simple tics, including ADHD. Simple tics are involuntary, there was one, muscle contractions that can um, on some level be connected to many disorders such as shivers or twitches or coughs, mostly because people with one disorder have comorbid ones that include tics. There are many tic disorders, the most commonly known one being Tourette's, but there's a lot of other ones as well. Many critics of mental illness TikTok talk a lot about how everybody on TikTok is convinced they have Tourette's and they're faking tics. And this drives me up the wall because first of all, Tourette's syndrome is not the only tic disorder and tic disorders as a concept are actually fairly common. Tourette's syndrome is categorized by tic clusters or more complex tics, often ones involving vocalizations or larger movements. Um, and most of the discussions I see online in association with anxiety, OCD, ADHD, PTSD, and autism are ones that generally likely potentially include comorbid tic disorders. So yes, AD, your, your anxiety, your ADHD, your whatever may include tics, but it's not that that disorder is the reason you have the tics is that there's likely a comorbidity with a tic disorder because everything is interconnected and diagnostic categories are not as concrete and separate as we think that they are. There have also been stories lately of how like, oh, ticking has gone up more in the population because of trends on TikTok. And the conclusion being drawn from that is that kids are faking tics to fit in. Other conclusions are also likening it to instances of like the 17th century Europe dancing mania situation. Now, <laughs> I can't speak for what researchers are saying about this because I'm not up to date on all of my tick research and I will explain why that is in a second. But what I can say is that with most disorders, most researchers on that disorder do not have the lived experience of said disorder because if you have the lived experience, it is emotionally harder to do full-time research on that. And so researchers will often come up with results that make people with the lived experience go, I'm sorry, you came to what conclusion now? That makes no sense. And as somebody who gets occasional ticks, they get triggered by things. My primary tick triggers are two things. The first one is uh, like when PTSD brain does bad memory things, my body, I'll explain why that's happening in a minute. Um, my body will tick and that's just how it processes things. I can't explain it. It's just a thing that happens. The other thing is when I'm super overstimulated to the point of exhaustion and I can't stim to get out that energy, my body will force energy out of my body via ticks. I usually get super ticky right before bed. That's my sign to go to sleep. I also, for the record, never tick when I'm on stage. For some reason, when I'm performing, my tick brain shuts off and I don't get it. But my other major tick trigger is seeing people tick, thinking about ticks or reading about ticks, which is why I'm really flinchy right now. And this is why I am deliberately not up to date on my tick research because it is not worth the tick induced migraine just to know the updated potentially flawed research. In the community, in the same way that people put up flash warnings for people with photosensitivity disorders, we also put up tick warnings so as to not trigger a tick attack in somebody else. And I'm not sure if it's a mirror neuron thing or what the deal is specifically, um, but it is well known in the disabled community that if you already get ticks and you see somebody else tick, you are more likely to start ticking as well. When I was abroad, I had a few close friends who also regularly ticked and we were all way more activated the few months that we were there because we would all set each other off and sometimes we'd have to separate ourselves from each other so that we could all like get our bodies to chill. Ticks also tend to happen when you're more exhausted and or stressed. So we were inevitably going to be seeing an increase in tick disorders solely because they would become more noticeable during the pandemic. It's not that tick disorders are contagious, but more like if you're really sleepy and you see somebody else who's super sleepy and you're together and you like they yawn, you're probably gonna end up yawning too. It's just a thing that happens and it's not 
permanent. So this whole everybody's developing and or faking Tourette's because they saw somebody tick online and think it's cool is the majority of the time just people responding naturally with their bodies and brains to seeing more people like them. Another way to look at this is something I experienced a few years ago when I started watching authentic autistic representation for the first time. I had a partner who was not very nice who told me that I needed to be careful not to watch too much autistic media because it was making me more autistic. When what was really happening was that I was becoming more comfortable with myself and learning to unmask and learning that these weird things that I did were actually normal. It's not that I was trying to mimic those characters to be cool or that I was suddenly becoming autistic when I wasn't before. It's just that beforehand I was manifesting my traits in ways that were easier to hide, like twirling my hair rather than flapping my hands. I also, in seeing representation of myself for the first time, got more emotionally attached to those characters, which made the empathetic roller coaster of that media way more exhausting. And when I'm more tired, I seem more autistic because I have less energy to suppress the generally frowned upon autistic traits. I also became more autistic over the pandemic because my priorities shifted, my energy shifted. I had less people bullying me for certain more unconventional traits, which therefore made me do them more. And I was also more exhausted and stressed, so I had a harder time masking. This also happened to coincide with me watching a lot of other autistic and disabled creators online and finding my community for the first time because during the pandemic everything moved online and so to a researcher it might look like the media I was consuming made me sicker but in fact I was just manifesting the exact same experience in different ways that are in fact healthier for me as a human being. But that being said that's not always a good thing. We often hear discussions of TikTok talk about medical student syndrome, which is a term for when a medical student is learning about a specific disorder, and then they start to wonder if they have that disorder, and then they start paying attention to things, and then their symptoms get worse because they're paying attention to them, and then they start to panic that maybe just maybe they have this thing, and that they need to seek medical attention, and that they're inherently broken and they need to fix themselves, and it all spirals out of control. And it's super easy for this feeling, this need to pathologize normal behaviors to become medical anxiety that does spiral out of control in adults. So think about what this does to kids who are too young to know how to sit down and read research papers and start to think critically about it, or to realize that diagnostic criteria are inherently flawed and present very differently in developing brains with many things that are age appropriate for a teenager being a pathologized medical issue for an adult, or that you should only really need to be worried about diagnostics if you feel like your life is being impeded by these symptoms or traits, or that your life could be better if you handled them and you want to learn more about them or seek help. Because about 32% of TikTok users are between the age of 10 and 19, and that's where this stuff kind of gets sketchy. But this can go in the opposite direction as well. People can start to think like, oh, this is what this disorder is supposed to look like, but I've been diagnosed with this disorder, but I don't do this or act like this, so am I broken? Is something else wrong with me? Am I faking or lying, et cetera, et cetera, and spiral themselves out of getting the help that they need in a different direction. I can very much say this happens to me a lot. It is one of the reasons I don't watch disability or neurodivergent-centered content anymore unless I'm researching for a video. Part of that is because like whenever I consume disability content, it feels like it's for work at this point and I can't shift my brain out of work mode. But another huge part of it is that when I start watching that stuff, I feel my anxiety heighten. I feel myself start to spiral and convince myself that maybe I'm faking these things that I genuinely experience and have diagnosed and some things that I don't have diagnosed but systemically know why that's the case because I don't present the commonly accepted way for that disorder. Even though I very much know that everything is a spectrum and everything presents super differently, even I, with critical thinking skills so strong that I accidentally pulled apart one of my professor's entire careers of research within three hours of going through his methodology started to spiral out of control with this stuff. I still, I still do. But that aside, there's also this aspect that as apps try to get our attention to make maximum profit, everybody's getting more impatient. Everybody's having a harder time focusing. Everybody's wanting more instant gratification. And generally attention spans are and have been getting shorter. So more people are presenting with a handful of ADHD traits right now, just due to the reality that we live in. In the same way that like, more people are presenting a lot of traits of general anxiety and depression as a natural, normal response to the terrible everything that we are living through right now. And that brings us to the next section of like, centering things on diagnostics gets really tricky really quickly. Because the thing with mental illness is, in order to get diagnosed, one of the pieces is that the symptoms have to be either getting in the way of you being able to live your life how you want to live it, or often, other people thinking it's getting in the way of you being able to live your life how you want to live it, which leads to a system where we are gatekeeping care and people can only truly access that care when they're in absolute crisis mode. So on some level, 
I'm not actually that mad about the fact that people are discovering these traits earlier and starting to learn about them and learning to self-regulate before they hit crisis mode. It's also important to note that in the United States, more than half of the people who need professional mental health care do not have access to it for a variety of reasons. And I would expect that in young people, this number is gonna be way higher because in order to receive that mental health care, you need to ask your parents to bring you to therapy and uh, those parents need to be willing to actually bring you to therapy, which many parents are not. And I'm not saying that TikTok in any way is a solution here because no, but it does on some level point out massive gaps in our mental health care system that these stories that villainize the app on the news and whatnot tend to not speak about at all. Wonder why that is. Now, a lot of the conclusions I see on this topic end up being that everybody needs to just log off the app and go to a licensed healthcare professional, which I don't think is the correct answer um, because Here's the thing. I was told by my first doctor that girls don't get autism and I was therefore denied the care that I needed because that licensed healthcare professional was super behind in his understanding of updated research. I was told by another doctor that I had a panic disorder when I in fact had a cardiac issue that was causing the panic attacks and I was therefore put in the wrong kind of care for like six years that was not helping me very much. And I was privileged enough in both of those cases to say, well, that doesn't feel right and go find a second opinion. But many people cannot even afford the first opinion opinion or get off a wait list to get the first opinion. And as somebody in the chronic illness community, I hate to say this, but a lot of licensed health healthcare professionals are just as ableist and biased and incorrect as any other field of people. And part of that has to do with media that we consume and that's why I talk about media consumption so much, but that's not like TikTok media, it's like if the only autism representation you see is Rain Man, then you're gonna think that's what autism looks like so you can't diagnose your patients properly, if that makes sense. But the problem is with our licensed healthcare professionals, they have an absurd amount of confidence in thinking that they can't be ableist or biased because they work with X, Y, and Z people all the time so they get it, which can be very extra harmful because they are gatekeeping these diagnoses. Now, I'm not saying that all healthcare professionals are bad or clueless, but they can fall into a lot of the same traps that regular people do. And perpetuating the idea that they are the only ones who know anything about this stuff can be very harmful for people who are consistently told that they are fine or lying or faking by the medical professionals in their lives, particularly multiple minority people like people of color, uh, gender non-conforming people or minority gendered people, um, fat people, etc., etc. And I know that seeing other creators with my disabilities talk openly about their experiences with their disabilities made me realize I wasn't faking and that medical trauma is unfortunately pretty normal and that there is hope for getting care and feeling better. And they also made me realize that like, I know my own body and my own experience better than somebody who's outside looking in and that I need to advocate for my own needs. They gave me the words and the labels to be able to describe what I was experiencing so I knew what to research off the app to be able to support myself in the ways that I needed to be supported. There's also nothing inherently wrong with labeling on some level. Like I said earlier, finding words for things, whether that's disability or gender or sexuality, helped me to feel less alone and less bad about myself and pointed me in the direction of the care that I needed or the community that I needed but was not receiving from the care team or community that I had. But it's important to note that as soon as I learned about those things on social media, I immediately left social media and went to the actual research papers and I learned from a combination of people discussing their personal experiences and and the formal literature on the topic, well knowing the potential flaws of both options. The thing is, when it comes to labeling online, it's more often like, oh my god, I'm so OCD about how my rib gets organized, rather than a community of people who are struggling to find each other. And sure, that community exists, it definitely exists, you can find it, but in order to get there, you have to wade through a lot of really weird, unhelpful, and often harmful content. And the reclaiming of labels is also more typically people using them to dilute genuine struggles or discriminate against other people, and people will compare the number of diagnoses they have like it's some sort of social capital or like oppression Olympics or something. But all of that being said, I also know that the diagnostic criteria that is currently in use needs to be set on fire and thrown out of the nearest window. It is based on pathologizing anything that deviates from what is considered to be normal and normal in like the 1950s when it began, which is a cishet able-bodied white male. I can't even tell you how many diagnoses I have technically amassed in my lifetime and how for me, it made me realize that all of these things about myself that I saw as inherently flawed are just different. And if they're not getting in my way, they shouldn't be pathologized. So at this point, I enjoy collecting diagnoses. Like I like to see how the, you know, psychiatric industrial complex is a mess and I think it's funny, but I don't like sit down and be like, well, I'm more oppressed than you because I have seven DSM diagnoses. Like that's what I'm seeing a lot of and that is that is a no. Um, the idea that, oh, everybody has mental illness these days is honestly wonderful because yeah, 
we do. Because rather than change the world to be accessible and inclusive and treating people like people, we are pathologizing normal reactions to the way that things are right now. And I would love for the entire psychiatric diagnostic empire to just crumple to the ground and for people to realize that neurotypicality isn't a real concept and the lines between all of these categories are blurry and messy and confusing and obtuse. Like, let's just stop gatekeeping diagnoses and therefore adequate care. Let's dilute the meanings of words like hyperfixation that inherently pathologize normal behaviors. Let's normalize conversations about mental illness and let's just burn the whole psychiatric industrial complex to the ground. I'm ready, let's go. We all know that's not what's happening. That's not what's happening on TikTok right now. Like we can want to believe that's where they're headed as a movement, but that's not what's happening here because that kind of activism requires a lot of time and a lot of a nuance to explain. And I don't necessarily explain it in all of my videos, but if you go to my other content that is long form, you can find those things. And I've linked them all up in the cards for you to find. And it also takes a lot of time and a lot of uh, energy and nuance to understand them for yourself. I only came to these conclusions after reading lots of research papers and working within the disability community for a while and reading 75 books for my thesis. And I can totally call myself out on this and say like, the things I'm about to critique in creators are things I did in my early two, three months on this channel before I got more in depth into the activist community. Online activists tend to do the whole, I have this disorder and therefore I am the expert in this disorder and my experience of said thing is universal. When in the world of autism, it is usually a very hyper-specific subsection of autism, typically white verbal low support needs that. And often in talking about that experience of autism, people tend to discredit other experiences, silence other voices, discriminate against others in our community, and leave behind other groups of people in our activism, which makes it objectively unhelpful activism if all you're doing to uplift one group is to try to say, we're just like you, and stomp on another one. And the people who do this kind of activism often think that they can't be discriminatory towards other people because they're part of a minority, so they understand. And this is how we end up with situations where certain famous autistic TikTokers, not saying any names, say racist stuff and refuse to acknowledge their mistakes, or certain famous disability influencers being super transphobic and stealing content from smaller creators of color and that just being swept under the rug, or people spreading the idea that everybody in power or everybody we don't like is neurotypical, which is a very dangerous idea that we've also talked about before on this channel, or that physically disabled people are more privileged than mentally disabled people because their disability is more acceptable, which no, it's just a different. Or continuing to demonize other mental disabilities and deliberately trying to separate the view of yours from more stigmatized mental illnesses and developmental disorders. Or demonizing others who share the same disorder, saying, well, I pulled myself together and I overcame this part of my disability, so why haven't you? That's not an excuse. And I'm not saying that people with lived experiences should shut up and that we should only listen to people who have PhDs or whatever, because as we discussed earlier, that is super flawed and many people with lived experiences know way more than professionals without that experience. And also like the infrastructure is not in place for people with these lived experiences to be able to thrive in a setting where they could get a PhD. So it's, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, discrimination situations there, but it doesn't mean that people with lived experiences can't and won't get stuck in the same biases as literally everybody else. And activists perpetuating these biases is just as dangerous as doctors doing so, if not more so given the way that they are platformed. And it's really hard to know who has done the research and who has that knowledge of the social capital on top of their own lived experience and who doesn't. Like for a different example, in the world of disability consultancy, people will often get hired to consult on the disabled experience in films and TV just because they have a disability. Meanwhile, other activists like me who have that lived experience as well as extensive experience in media studies and analyzing disability media tropes and safety and whatnot, we look at that same representation and we see it as blatantly dangerous. It's also how we get in situations where supposedly fully inclusive neurodivergent spaces that have done the research and are qualified because they're run by some neurodivergent people will end up being super unsafe for any remotely femme presenting person, trans person, or person of color because they didn't bother to do enough research to realize that accessibility is way more than just putting a bunch of people of the same identity in the same room and that maybe we should, there should be some sort of safeguards in play to uh, protect people from bordering on incel behavior. But in short form content, it is very, very difficult to show your sources or explain your credentials so people just don't. And once you see somebody's face enough, you just kind of assume that they must be legit and listen to everything that they have to say. And that is inherently a problem because sure, somebody could Google me and they could learn about my thesis work and find my resume and go, oh yeah, they know what they're doing, but nobody's actually gonna do that. They're gonna trust that anybody who is talking about this stuff on the internet is going to have done their research. And that is terrifying. There are so many activists that are doing the work and putting in the effort and actually actively working as activists and have their sources everywhere. Or if the platform makes it hard to list sources, we'll 
direct you to other places where their sources live, but there are just as many who are just going on the internet and naming their lived experience as fact for everybody under the same umbrella term. And because of the algorithm, these two things are put side by side as equally valuable sources when they objectively are not. Also speaking of algorithms, basically anything that exists at this point has one. There's the Netflix page and like YouTube's recommended, your For You page, whatever it is. But the TikTok algorithm seems particularly good at what it does. And all of the sources that I found about this were weird and unhelpful. So I'm not gonna say anything vaguely, vaguely factual about why that is, but I'm going to assume that because it is short form content, you consume more of it. So therefore it does a better job at picking what you want rather than a YouTube or Instagram algorithm ever could. And in doing that, it connects a lot of dots that people might not even realize are connected. For example, if you follow a lot of trans and queer creators, you at some point will find yourself on the mental illness side of TikTok. Why? Because trans and queer people tend to experience higher rates of mental illness due to discrimination. A lot of trans and queer creators are sponsored by Pride Counseling, and therefore a lot of people who like these creators probably also like mental illness content because it's relatable to them, and so it is therefore provided to you. And this can be great because over the pandemic, a lot of my friends realized by being thrust into the world of autistic TikTok that they are autistic and were able to get their diagnoses and support and understand themselves better and overall be happier and better people. That has happened to so many people and our community has grown so much and that is super, super cool. But on the other hand, if you watch one video that relates to say, unaliving oneself, I know that's a cringy term, but I really don't wanna get this demonetized. I worked hard on this video. Um, maybe because it was an enrapturing story you were interested in, or maybe it was one of those like true crime stories paying, playing over top of, of like making a cake and you didn't even notice what the audio was. The algorithm is gonna start to send you more of that content, which means that people who are struggling with certain ideations are being fed more content, encouraging said ideation, which is really, really dangerous. And this also ties into the medical anxiety where you keep seeing more and more of the content around this thing that you're panicking you might have, and it makes you completely spiral out of control. But like everything, it's not black or white, this is bad and this is good situation because TikTok is helping somewhat to normalize mental health conversations. It is helping people to find themselves and others like them and to feel less alone for once. It is motivating people to go get the help that they need and that they deserve. Internet resources make things inherently more accessible. It takes them out of the hands of the few elite who wield that information and make it more easily understood by the rest of the population. And I think that is so, so important. That's why we have so much love for video essays these days. That's why that is the thing. And I also think on some level, many educators are helping with understanding and destigmatization and hey, people like me aren't scary conversations, teaching us about experiences that we never would have even thought about before and letting us see people from completely different walks of life as people just like us. Like the, um, there's so many sections of TikTok that, that do this. Like, like the first example that's coming to my mind is um, like prison reform TikTok. Like what? But it's really important. And because it's just randomly showing up on people's pages, people are learning about this stuff and realizing that we need to reform our prisons, right? Like these conversations are happening that are super, super important that I don't think would have happened with a different kind of algorithm. Like the TikTok algorithm is very lucrative for that kind of stuff. But at the same time that this is widening empathy for many people, it's also making a lot of other people take us less seriously. As numbers of people with specific minority experiences go up, such as mental illnesses or disabilities or trans identities, the general response is this is becoming a trend and therefore people are faking things for attention. And as we talked about in my Munchausen by Proxy video a while ago, there are a lot of people who are making videos about people faking disorders. And that is like a trend on, I don't know if it's a trend on TikTok because I don't actually go on the app, but I know it's a YouTube trend. And because these narratives are really popular right now, people are thinking that faking disorders is more common than it really is, which is a serious issue because then people get into the habit of looking at every single disabled person that they meet and try to point out all of the reasons that we are actually just faking it for attention and don't really have our disabilities. My comments get flooded with that kind of stuff all the time. And it's an excuse to deny us necessary accommodations, to discriminate against us, to abuse us, and to completely discredit our entire existence. Doctors also see more of these stories and start to feel the need to further gatekeep diagnoses that are already near impossible to get, therefore preventing people from getting the care that they really need. And it also makes people with disabilities convince themselves that, oh, maybe we don't have them, we don't deserve care, and we're just bad and lazy people, which is absolutely not okay. Rather than try to take my old script and then rewrite it so it's slightly different points, I'm just going to quote from a Munchausen by Proxy video. If you want to watch it, you can check it out up here. And here's the deal. There's always going to be fakers. Just like some people continue to queer bait because it gets them attention, there is a certain level of intention and pity that's put upon disabled people that for people who are used to being treated unkindly or outright ignored in life is appealing. 
and this will always be the case no matter what. But also, if we started treating all humans, regardless of ability, as real people with equal and important needs and appreciate everybody's own quirks and make everything accessible to everyone, the instances of people doing this would be infinitely less frequent. This trend of faking disorders should not be something that we look at and decide that everybody on planet Earth is faking their disabilities. These disorders are getting too common and we should make the diagnostic criteria more specific and we should now pick apart every disabled person that we see to try to figure out who is and isn't faking and where the lie is. This should be a wake-up call for us to realize that the reason that all of these people feel the need to do this and feel an affinity to groups of mentally ill people and the need for accommodations is that we're not treating humans in our society properly, especially the younger ones. Things aren't accessible, things aren't kind, people aren't welcoming or accepting. And the fact that everybody everywhere has an anxiety disorder in the younger generations should be a pretty big red flag that something is fundamentally wrong with the world and that we maybe need to do something to change it. And don't give me the whole special snowflake argument that we should tough it up because you did when you were a kid. Because first of all, times change. So it could be more traumatizing now than it was. And second of all, if you think that people today don't deserve basic kindness just because you didn't get that and turned out fine, you didn't turn out fine, I'm sorry, but it's the case. The last thing that most concerns me about how we talk about this conversation that I wasn't able to put into words until one of the videos I watched to research this video started to do this is that people are comparing the social trendiness of mental illness, aka a lot of people finding out who they really are, some people starting to convince themselves that they have things they might not, and a lot of other people just becoming more comfortable around inherently unthreatening new kinds of people, to rapid onset gender dysphoria. Um, and in these conversations around teens all think they're mentally ill now, this is being linked to teens all think they're trans now, um, that we're making up genders for attention, that we are only saying we're trans to fit in with a social group. And if you don't know what rapid onset gender dysphoria is, or I guess isn't because it's not real, um, it's the idea that as soon as one person in a friend group realizes they're trans and comes out to their friends, everybody else starts to suddenly think that they too are trans and therefore peer pressured into coming out and transitioning when they shouldn't be or something absurd like that. It's super debunked. It's super unfounded. We know that when one person is brave enough to share their experience, lots of others will do the same thing and that trans people have always existed. Also, all of the baby queers tend to find each other and become friends before any of them realize that they have that identity in common. This is how development works. Um, particularly, I a bunch of my like friends from middle school, I, I switched schools for high school. So I like haven't seen these people since I was in middle school have all, we've all like vaguely reconnected and every single one of us is autistic and queer now. And none of us knew it back then, but we were all best friends. Like it's, it's just what happens. But I hope that you can see how this uh, rapid onset gender dysphoria rhetoric is super, super dangerous. And what I'm concerned about watching so many commentary YouTubers talk about how everybody on TikTok is a kid who is too young to understand themselves enough and that the adults in their lives need to come and tell them to log off the app and shut up is that we are further encouraging the idea that we should be discrediting young people just because they are young. And that really concerns me. Um, it really concerns me that creators often will go like, everybody out here thinks that they have autism or that they're like star gender or something, as if mental illnesses and gender and sexuality are all to be lumped into the same category. Do I think that not everybody is equipped with the critical thinking skills to use this app properly or safely? Absolutely. Do I think that we need to have more regulations in place on some level to protect these people? Absolutely, but the solution of discrediting every single person who has found themselves in a way that is not hurting themselves or anybody else, even if it is a bit weird or a bit atypical or a bit out of the norm, is not the right one at all in the slightest. Neither is the solution of banning it, but we're not talking about that today. That's a whole other freaking can of worms. I think that when we talk about the dangers of social media, it very easily tips into the kids these days are all a disaster, discrediting an entire generation, just trying to make it in a world where they've been handed a lot of grossly unregulated and overwhelming tools from a bunch of adults who aren't even bothering to regulate stuff and are trying to figure out how to work with them and integrate them into our lives. It also discredits the fact that everybody, regardless of generation, struggles with critical thinking skills, mainly because our education system refuses to teach them, because if we know how to think critically, we can realize that the system's a mess and start to tear it down, and that's terrifying to people in power, blah, 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 blah. And in a time in history where minority people are rapidly losing rights, particularly trans and queer and disabled people, maybe now is a bad time to be blanketly discrediting all of trans and disabled activists that exist on that app. Because, yeah, TikTok's a mess, but it's made as much positive change as it is made negative. And there is way too much nuance for the solution to just be like, let's log off and never open the app again, particularly because the harmful parts of this rhetoric can and will continue offline or on other platforms as well. 
And I know that all of this seems a bit of a conflict of interest because I do have a following on said app and generally make money as an online educator. I truly only open TikTok to post a video um, and then I leave the app. I don't particularly enjoy it. I'm more of a like long educational video essay while I do homework kind of person. Um, but hopefully the amount of messy pros and cons I put into this video can show that I'm just as conflicted as the next person. My biggest concern in all of this is how the TikTok conversation is being used to further a narrative of not listening to young people, of just crediting everything that we have to say about ourselves and saying that people in power in the medical field know absolutely everything. Because that narrative can and will be used against not just my generation, but a whole population of minorities. And it it is right now. We're seeing that with anti-trans legislation and I fear that it is only going to get worse. So be careful with your kids these days complaints. You don't need to understand us to treat us like human beings who deserve to be listened to and get proper medical care. And your issues with this whole situation should be directed more towards the people who are deliberately spreading dangerous misinformation, the fact that things in general need to be way more regulated, and the fact that this is showing clear flaws in both our healthcare and our education systems. And in general, we really should just kind of, I don't know, shut up and listen to and believe minority people. Seems like a pretty good general policy to have. But anyway, I'm gonna leave this one here. Let me know what you think about all of this. I would love to hear your opinions, but only if they are kind. Um, as always, thank you for listening. Thank you for learning. Thank you for thinking critically. That is very important. We need to do more of that. Remember, it's never too late to start over. I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one. Also, if you don't know what's up with my channel, things are changing for the month of April. I posted that video on Wednesday. I will link it up here. It's also like on my homepage if you just open it. Um, but I will see you with more long form educational content in this style in May. And you can watch all my really cool documentaries in the meantime. And anyway, yeah, I will see you in the next one and the next, next one.